Electric motors have changed very little since the early 1900s. Sure, there are many variations such as repulsion start induction run or capacitor start induction run, but the mechanics and even how they look has changed very little. Contrasted with advances in materials, applied physics, and engineering, this truly is a remarkable feat of human ingenuity. In this video, I continue with my Walker Turner 10 inch table saw restoration, specifically focusing on the single phase, one horsepower, original driver line motor. As you will see, this is more than simply replacing the bearings, but a complete restoration that takes me into the heart of the motor. There's lots of great opportunities along the way, so let's get started right now.
been a couple days since I opened up the stator housing. Once I got that open and I took a look inside here, I did that basic vacuuming and then just the condition of the wires and how many things are going on inside here, mechanical parts and all that. I just put it down and walked away. Felt like I needed to do some more research so I could be a bit more comfortable uh, before I get in here and start fiddling around with this thing. So basically my uh, goal for this next step is just to clean the dust away and so I can really see what's going on inside here. The wires, although they have some color to them, some of the coloration is gone. So I wanna make sure that I don't mix those wires up and I can see what they are so uh, I replace them with the same kind. I'm hoping my initial pictures were thorough and clear enough so that I can tell what's going on. But for this next step, let's get in and get it cleaned up and remove some of this dust. So I did find one potential issue, and that's right here. This one wire happens to be broke, it's severed some, for some reason. So that one and that piece right there. Now it, it's important because it's exiting the winding, I believe, and then going to head over here to connect to lead wires. So it definitely needs to be fixed. I want to set the stator aside for just a little bit because I had to order some parts for that and I just got a soldering iron in which I'm going to eventually need anyway to replace the leads. So for now I want to get into this end bell a little bit see if I can clean it up 
and then take this switch mechanism out of here and just generally I'm going to clean this and make sure it is operating well and I'll eventually have to resolder these uh, leads here. I don't honestly think I need to take this apart. I'm just going to clean it up, make sure all this stuff is out of here, and then of course um, I'll have to re-solder these connections. I should have had this um, earlier when I was doing this a little bit of uh, work on the stator what it is is this CRC uh, QD electronic cleaner and I've seen this from um, other restorers and it's just safe uh, for the varnish and the insulation it doesn't affect that in any way so I think this is some kind of plastic but I'm not sure um, if it's got some kind of uh, finish on it that could be harmed with any other chemicals. So just gonna try this. Um, seems like a good idea to just use chemicals that you know are safe for certain situations. I spent a considerable amount of time cleaning up this switch here. I think it came out pretty good. I had to order these different braided wires to try to recreate the vintage look. I also didn't have a soldering iron, so I needed to research um, that and order one. And this is literally my first attempt at soldering. This wire back here adds a little bit more tension than it had originally, so I hope that's not an issue. Other than that, I think it's pretty well recreated. So this is pretty delicate. Um, I'm gonna take my time here and I'm gonna do that off camera. 
because it's just going to take me so long to cut all this back and get it ready for soldering. Definitely solid repair. There it is, first one done. After repairing this capacitor wire here, I got to work on repairing the brake and then these connections here. For this one, I just spliced it with the same gauge wire. I'm gonna spend some time cleaning up some of this adhered uh, residue here. And then once I'm done with all that and I've got this really super clean, I'll get to work on each one of these connections. Sometimes if these wires are in decent shape, maybe they're degraded out here, but they're still good back here, you can just splice onto them and then that is your repair. But in this case, since they're so bad all the way back to the coils, I'm gonna just separate these right at the coils and then wrap the uh, fresh wire on, um, solder that, and that's gonna be the repair. So let me get to work on that and I will show you the result once that's all completed. All right, so I've got to the point of the project where I have uh, replaced the varnish here. I replaced the leads a couple times and I just cannot get enough clearance for, this, uh, for the stator housing to fit over the stator. I've tried a couple mock fits and it's just not working. So what I had to do was order some 12, um, 14 gauge uh, lead wire. This is all 12 gauge. So unfortunately, even though I've already done all this work, I even had the uh, stator lacing done. There's just not enough room. So I have to take all this off and I'm gonna replace it with the smaller gauge. Um, hopefully that will give me enough clearance. One of the problem areas is right here. There's very little room for these leads to pass between the housing and the stator and then come out through into the terminal box. So hopefully the smaller gauge will give me a little bit more clearance. The other issue is that with the friction tape, there's just literally no clearance here. Um, and then of course the tie rod uh, bolt, uh, bolts need a place to go through. And then the other issue I encountered is there's very little room to actually pass a stator cord through the windings. So with that, I just need every little bit of free space that I could get. So let me go ahead and take all this off and I'll bring you back when I'm getting ready to solder the new leads on. All right, I've got this white lead cleaned up, ready to solder. Let's see how that goes. That looks pretty good. Let me get this cleaned up and I'll put some heat shrink tube over that. I have replaced every single lead on here and I'm back at the point where I'm just uh, re-wrapping re the coils. Wanted to just show you a quick trick. I have some very thin Kevlar thread. That was what I could find that would fit in between the very tight spaces I have here. If you get in a similar situation, what you can do is you take some super glue and you just put it on for about an inch. And obviously I was wearing gloves when I did it, but you put a little bit of super glue on and then you spread it out get to the very end and you twist it um, and then just hold it there until the super glue dries and what you end up with is a stiffened end here where um, that allows you to uh, stick it through the stator there a little bit easier. So there's other ways people do it. This seemed to work so uh, might be helpful for you and uh, I'm going to move on and finish wrapping this. Alright so I'm taking a quick break from uh, relacing 
the stator. I wanted to stop and do another dry fit and I'm pretty uh, happy with the results so far. That is going to work. The wires are tucked in exactly where they need to be so I'll have clearance. The one issue I think I'm running into is that this over the years has just been beat up so much that it's got quite a few dents in it and it's out around. I went and visited a friend of mine out here uh, at a machine shop and I got a piece of scrap steel. Basically this is around six and a half inch diameter and what I'm going to do is set this inside here, put the stator housing over it and then using a body hammer that he also loaned me. I'm going to come through here and just try to work, work out the dents and uh, not only that but get the round back in. So I think what's happening when I do the dry fit, everything, the stator fits in here, everything fits okay, but there's just that one last little bit of clearance where the end bells, um, once they're seated onto here, they don't want to fit correctly onto the stator. They don't seat all the way, so I end up with a little gap. When I take the stator out and I just put the end bells on here, it fits perfectly. So um, separately it fits, together it doesn't. There's just a little bit of a gap, about a sixteenth of an inch on one side. And I think it is because of the, um, the radius here is not true. So let me try to work on that and I'll bring you back when I'm done there and uh, we'll see how that dry fit goes. I'm hoping it'll solve the issue. All right, so that worked marvelously. I was able to put the radius back into this um, housing here and uh, this area here was completely flat from the dent that was there and it's not perfect, but I got most of that out and so that allowed everything to fit just a little bit better and then to bring it just a, a slight a bit tighter, I ground the inside of the feet on these end bells using some sandpaper that I just taped down to a, a piece of tile. And then that just allowed me to remove the gap that was here just a little bit better. So I think that's a good result. The next step is I'm going to take this back apart and finish wrapping the winding coils. I'm done relacing the windings and I've had the stator sitting in my little heater box here for a couple hours, uh, just rotating it so it gets nice and warm. I also placed the, um, the insulating varnish in there as well. It's been about a month since I put that first coat on and there's been a lot of uh, opportunities along the way. So here's what that looks like after the cords are all on there. I'm not going to cover all this. I'll probably bring the varnish up to about here. I just put some heat shrink wrap right here where the wires will cross the edge of the stator on their way out to the terminal box. And then just gently put a little bevel right here, very small, just enough to take that hard edge off there that may cut these wires over time. Let me get this out of my way and I'll get the uh, varnish recoded. All right, I've got the rotor relaced and went ahead and reapplied the varnish. Uh, a couple really thick coats in there to try to get it to soak down as deep as possible so that it would just infiltrate every aspect of those coils. So I'm hoping that did the job and this is ready to just kind of set aside and wait for reassembly. So the next step here is just to keep working on the rotor. I've already taken the switch apart. In fact, I did that because once I took a closer look at the spring, I noticed that one of the legs here was snapped. So um, there was no way to fix that or replace it without actually taking the pin out that holds the switch on there and then of course once I took the first one out I decided to take the next one and then the whole switch came right out and that actually allowed me to clean up this thing pretty easily so I uncoiled half a coil on this spring and then just refabricated a leg here and overall the the spring is in pretty good condition so I think I'll be able to just reuse that 
I do have some spring material on order just in case I need to remake it as a backup option, but I think this is gonna do the trick. So I'll just continue cleaning up this rotor. Made some good progress on this side, a little bit more work to do. This is the tedious side here. So what I'm doing with this is just a little bit of an abrasive pad with Brasso clipped into a, uh, these are forceps or something and then I can just get in, in there pretty easily with those um, and clean up. It's pretty tedious, but this at least allows the job to proceed. So that's where I'm at, uh, continuing to move forward on the rotor. All right, my spring material arrived, and uh, during the time I was waiting for that, I continued to research on springs, and apparently that is called a double torsion spring. I did not know that a couple weeks ago. I also picked up a bracelet making mandrel, just a cheap one off Amazon. Seems to work though. And then the last part is I found a video last night from the spring maker and he's got a tutorial on his channel on how to make uh, a double torsion spring along with many other types of springs. So you take your mandrel and you, you drill about three quarters of the way through that so you can insert a post and the post needs to have a little notch that's at the height of whatever you need this little leg to be um, and that way it has something to catch as you wind your uh, spring and put torque on it. So uh, I'm going to give it a shot. I've got a couple that I've already done and uh, some look the part and others are uh, not quite the part. So I'm going to keep making some more and I'll choose the best two. Uh, so let's get into this and I'll show you how I'm making the double torsion springs. All right, I've got the torsion springs all fabricated and started putting the switch back together. Because I took the original pins off, I had to grind them off. I'm remaking them. So I've got copper slating nails and they happen to be the exact diameter of the original pins. And I'm hoping I can just pin one side over and that'll act as just enough of a uh, a catch there to keep everything together. I've done one here. So I cut the pin off just to give me enough room for a bit of a flange as I peen this thing over. The lesson there is just to take your time That looks like it worked. All right, so I went back and just ground down the rivet heads just a little bit, the factory head. So I thought um, having them much bigger than the opposite side might throw off the, um, the weight for the centrifugal force to activate that. Maybe it would activate it too soon or too late, and then that would just throw off the function of the motor. So that is done. The springs, although you know they're not perfectly manufactured, they are new and they are working.
and that shine that you see right here on the uh, end rings of the rotor, I just put some clear insulating varnish on that to hopefully keep those from oxidizing. This is done. The last little thing I'll do is I'll just touch up the chipped paint here on to the next step. All right, it's now time to start the step I've been waiting the longest for, and that is reassembly. I'm just gonna saturate the original sort of fiber bushing here with some three-in-one oil, non-detergent. It's in really good shape. So that goes in first, then the very thin steel washer, and then finally the spring washer. I think what that will allow is for a little bit of end play um, once the thing is fully assembled. All right, I'm over here at the rear end bell. This is like an insulation washer for the stationary switch, and this is all part of the centrifugal switch here. So as this thing gets up to speed, the switch here pulls away, the counterweights pull it away, and then that disengages the switch here to disengage the start capacitor. There you go. All right, next I'll put the uh, bearing onto the shaft here. Don't wanna to be too overzealous here, but I think that's seated correctly. Okay, at this point, I am going to put the stator into the rear end bell. That's got a little pinch right there. Okay, that looks pretty good. Okay, I've got the capacitor, put a little grommet on there, and I've got some clear heat shrink on these leads that will come out of the end bells to the capacitor just to hopefully keep those from fraying. So the next step is to put the stator housing back on and then feed these leads through. And of course, who knows how long this motor will last, but gotta at least put my signature on there. So the next time it gets opened up, maybe that'll still be there. Cleaning up these end bell faces and really trying to put this, the radius form back into this, the cylinder, I think really helped with that little step there.
So that's it. Next, I'll get the capacitor housing on there and solder the leads. All right, so I went ahead and soldered the capacitor back on off camera and I like to protect everything while I'm soldering. Got the original screws polished up here. I kind of like this old uh, sleeve here. Next step, I better get this thing hooked up and see if it actually works. All right, the motor's all buttoned up and wired for 220 volts. Finishing this project took a little over five months to complete, simply because it was my first ever attempt at working on an electric motor, and it just seemed like every aspect of it required me to learn some new skill or knowledge before I could proceed. This was by far the most technical aspect of the entire restoration series to this point, and I think I deserve a B plus, A minus, simply for persevering to the very end. In fact, when I first opened it up, I just walked away and began the research process, and of course, asking lots of questions. But I didn't quit, and that's the difference. So here I am with a beautifully restored antique motor, ready to do some work. Let's check it. There's a couple aspects of the restoration that I completed off camera, specifically the badges and the switch faceplate. I restored those using rubbing and polishing compound. It was fairly straightforward. It took a long time to do, but because they were in overall good condition, a couple scratches and just you know years of use, I figured I'd give that a shot before I attempted any kind of painting or anything. So I think those came out really nice. Of course, the painting, I did all that off camera. There's plenty of other professionals on YouTube you can learn from. I'm not that guy. I learned a brass plating technique from Terry Benko watching some of his restoration videos. And basically what you do is you take a little brass Dremel brush and whatever hardware that you want to plate, you heat that up with your torch, get it red hot, and then you run this, um, this brass wire brush over that and it essentially just transfers the brass over to that hardware. It's really awesome. Don't use it if the piece that you're attempting to use it on is a structural component of any kind. The places I used it were not structural so it didn't really matter. Like uh, right here on the switch, I think that came out awesome. Cool little trick. Then of course the electrical. I did all the electrical testing. I had to learn that all from scratch. All that was done off camera. The insulation resistance testing. Got the best readings on that possible. And then I tested all the leads for continuity. That's what I needed to do to determine the lead pairs. From there, I was able to take a diagram I received from Jeff at Vintage, uh, Walker Turner Service Machinery in Connecticut and then modify it to my specific application. So I made my own template, and then from there, I made a specific diagram that has uh, the colors and everything indicated for what I used on my motor. And since I'm posting those for you, you can screenshot that and adapt it to your specific situation if that's helpful. But the main question that we're all asking ourselves at this point, does it run? So let's see if we can do a maiden YouTube test run. Of course, I'm gonna put my hand on it because it's got quite a bit of torque and I don't wanna scratch it up any more than I have by trying to um, clamp it down. Look at that, huh? Five months. Yes, <laughs> winning. <laughs>
All right, if you made it to the end of this video and you're interested in the entire restoration series, please check out those videos over on my channel. As far as next steps for the restoration series, I'll be tackling the base, the fence, and the miter gauge, and of course some other loose ends and then reassembly. So I hope to have this thing up and running very soon. Before I go, I need to give a shout out to some folks that have helped me along the way with this motor. Terry Benko, John over at Scout Crafter, David Allen, um, anybody else I list in my description, those folks have been awesome and just answering questions, everyday workshop. And then if what brought you here to this video was that you want to tackle your own restoration of a motor, I encourage you to join the Facebook group, Antique Electric Motor Experts. There was so many people on there that just have years of experience. There's newbies like me, there's veterans, um, and they all are happy to answer questions. Uh, I could not have done this project without those folks. Just wanna give a shout out, credit where credit is due, and uh, I'll see you on the next one. Thanks so much for watching.